In my quest of figuring out what the last IBM branded desktop was, I picked up this huge M51. Unfortunately it's quite dead, so in this video we are going to troubleshoot and recap a socket 775 board. This machine is big, really big, and with the matching CRT display on top it becomes absolutely massive. If this really is the last model that IBM did, then I find it quite ironical how heavily inspired it is by the original IBM PC. They are pretty much the same size, and the front panel is sloped exactly in the same way as the original PC. So I'm not sure yet, but this is quite possibly the first and the last of IBM desktops. It's been a few years since I picked up this machine, so let's start with a test. Wow, those are loud fans. Holy cow, it sounds like a server. Okay, so fans are running at full speed, obviously. And we're getting absolutely nothing on the screen. And not even beeps from the BIOS. Okay, so that is definitely a dead machine. So my best guess here is that the machine senses that something is wrong. And that's probably why it runs the fans at full speed. Just like a server would. Like so many IBMs, it's very service friendly. So just by pushing on two tabs at the back, we can remove the entire lid and the front panel. And apparently this machine has an intrusion sensor here. With the lid off, we can then tilt the entire drive cage forward. Uh, this gives us access to pretty much anything in the machine. So let's start disconnecting stuff. And I'm gonna guess we just have to pull on this tab to remove the hard drive. Super easy machine to work on. Let's see if the diskette drive is as easy. Well, these drives have a bracket marked with blue paint. So, apparently we're supposed to push it. Now we can take this drive out. So let's just do that same trick with the DVD drive. Well, I'm happy to say there isn't going to be a lot of cleaning today. This machine is spotless, even the fan is clean. So let's disconnect the power supply, the intrusion sensor back here, and the hard drive. The ribbon cables have a really neat cable management. So they have basically split that cable in eight pieces, and then zip tie them together to make it really skinny. That should be pretty good for airflow. Down in the corner here, we have a custom connector and the cable going to the front panel for USB and audio. So definitely not a standard motherboard. This is IBM Custom and it has a big old IBM in the silk screen too. Even the cooler seems to be custom. It has IBM.com stamped on top of it. This is a Pentium 4 arrow machine. So we will probably find some kind of Pentium 4 here. I wasn't able to find the spec sheets for this machine. So I'm not really sure what the specs are. But I can see the IBM sticker underneath here. So this should be the original CPU. And it's an SL7PU. 3.0 GHz. By the way, I have replaced the coin cell. Because some motherboards can be a bit picky with a flat battery. But that didn't help. So at the time of this machine here, IBM weren't doing their own motherboards anymore. And I can't see any signs of who made this board for IBM. It's just marked DDR Rev 3.3. I did a quick visual inspection, but I can't see anything obviously wrong. The caps are not bulging, and I can't see any leakage on the board. So let's pull that board out and see what we can find. Okay, the first test is with a different power supply. This power supply is tested two days ago. So it should be good. The power switch is connected to that custom connector in the corner. So I ended up removing the power switch from the chassis too. Okay, let's turn it on and see what happens. The fan in the power supply turned on. And the power LED. But we've got nothing on the display. Okay, so the issue is probably not the power supply. Okay, so let's test the graphics next. Oh, that is extremely annoying. The power connector is too close to the PCI Express slot. So we can't install a graphics card with a cooler. Okay, I found and tested a skinny card. I find it quite remarkable 
that are huge companies like Foxconn or whoever made this board for IBM make such silly mistakes. Even this skinny card just barely fits in here. It is actually pushing on the power connector. Well, I went ahead and ordered an angled connector because I obviously want to install the fastest possible card in this machine. Okay, let's find out if we have bad graphics on the motherboard. Well, graphics card is tested five minutes ago, but we're still not getting anything on the display. Okay, so nothing wrong with the graphics. For the next test, I pulled one of the RAM sticks. These are, by the way, DDR400 with IBM part numbers. So probably original RAM. I am skipping ahead here, of course, but I do wait for at least a few seconds on each test boot. But uh, no, that didn't make a difference. In that case, I'll remove the other stick and install the one I removed. Let's try again. No, so it's not a RAM either. Cooler is getting warm, so the board is at least trying to do something. Okay, in that case, let's try with the postcard. Okay, let's turn the machine on and see if it will give us any clues. Oh, this board isn't doing anything at all. This board is dead as a doornail. It's not executing any code at all. Well, in that case, I'm going to place my bets on a bad cap somewhere on that board. But before we can pull caps off that board, there is something we need to do to make the rest of this video a lot more pleasant to watch or listen to, perhaps I should say. Because my super cheap preheater from eBay is incredibly noisy. I'll play some of that noise for you here, in case you're new to the channel. And here is what's making that awful noise. This tiny little fan. Apparently it's pretty amazing at making a lot of noise. And hopefully this Noctua NFA420 is going to be a lot kinder on your ears. I'm a bit surprised that they have such a tiny fan. But I guess it doesn't need much cooling. It would be an easy mod to install a larger fan. But if it's not needed, let's just use a tiny one. The kit actually included this adapter. So I just snipped that original cable off. I'll solder these two guys together. Okay, custom adapter done. Let's add some heat shrink to make sure we don't create any shorts. Okay, let's turn that power switch on and take a listen. Oh, what a difference! That thing is dead silent. Wow, that made a huge difference. So now finally, we don't need to listen to that extremely annoying sound. Okay, let's turn the power on and enjoy the silence of that Noctua fan. I'm gonna go with 130 degrees for this board. Okay, the board has reached 130 degrees underneath and it's about 95C on this side. I have marked all the caps to make this as easy and quickly as possible. Okay, the solder actually didn't come off that leg. So we may have to increase the temperature some more. But let's try a few first. The board is now at 100C on this side. No, this is actually not working. Okay, apparently that was a clogged desoldering gun. So that has now been fixed. Yeah, that worked much better. Yeah, this is totally working. So I guess I'll skip ahead here, not to bore you. Okay, I have to change tactics. This board is so stubborn. I have to add some leaded solder to all the pins. So the ground plane inside this board must be pretty damn thick. Yep, and now it totally works. So caps are falling off the board. And I have to keep removing them before they pop. Okay, that was the perfect recipe for this board apparently. So 140C and a splash of leaded solder on each pin. So all the caps but one are off the board now. But one guy is hidden underneath here. So we need to drop the holder 
for the heatsink. It's probably toasty, so I'm not going to touch it. Uh, now I can reach that last cap. There are some more polycaps underneath here, but I'm going to leave them in, at least for now. Because I've never had any issues with polycaps before, so they are probably good. Okay, that was the last cap. I'm gonna lower the temperature to 50. And let the board cool down slowly. Actually, I ended up replacing the polycaps too. I figured since I have all the stuff out anyways, and all the tools on the bench, might as well just go ahead and replace these too. And we can rule out one more fault. One thing worth mentioning here is that some boards, like this board here for instance, is marked like this on the negative side. But some boards, like this one here, has that same marking but on the positive side. That is extremely annoying and something to watch out for. So always check your board before you start removing caps. This is by the way the worst ground plane I've had to deal with so far. It takes ages to heat up those pads. I've got my soldering station at 450 and yet it takes forever to that pad to heat up. And this area here was the worst, so I'm considering putting the board back on the preheater actually. Otherwise this is going to take forever. And if you don't have a preheater, a cheap heat gun will do the job too. Just make sure to heat up the entire board. And not just the area where you're soldering your cap. Otherwise you're going to end up with a bent board. Okay, finally, just that one pad took more than a minute. So I'm going to solder these guys on the preheater. Yeah, so much quicker with extra heat. After I have soldered the cap, I always like to bend the leads back up again. Just in case someone ever repairs this board again. Or if I make a mistake, they are going to be a lot easier to remove. And if you ever need to recap one of these boards, here's my ugly cap list. Well, we are almost done here actually. So these are the last caps to go in. Okay, let's add some fresh heat paste to the Pennium 4. I'll reapply heat paste on the North Bridge too before I put the heat sink back on. And this is an Intel 915G by the way. And a big CPU cooler. It's a passive cooler, but it has a huge fan sitting in front of it, so it probably works really well. I better put that coin cell in too, in case it's a picky board. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see if this was a bad cap. No, <laughs> it wasn't. It's still not executing any code. This board is unfortunately still quite dead. Oh crap, that sucks. Being a board from the 2000s, I was sure this was a cap. It almost always is. I guess I should have tested the RAM sticks earlier. But now they are tested. And before we install them again, let's just clean at least one of the slots. With some dioxide and a brush. It wasn't likely to be two bad RAM sticks. But I guess it could be a bad connection. I'll add some more dioxide on the RAM stick. And then I'll install it. And remove it a few times. Uh, let's try again. No, unfortunately, it wasn't that easy. According to the postcard, all voltage rails are good. But let's check anyways. 5.0, 3.3, 11.0. Okay, so that all looks good. Let's check that green pin for power on. Let's turn the board off. It goes up to 5. When we turn the board on, it goes back to 0. And the power good is 4.7. Okay, so power seems good. And yet the ready LED doesn't light up. Let me reboot the machine. Okay, reset flashed, so it's working too. Let's check the RTC next. I'll disconnect the battery. I'll put something in between. 
and then measure between the battery and the pin and it's drawing 2.7 microamps so real-time clock is probably working too at least it's drawing current next I checked all the MOSFETs and all the voltage regulators on the board and they all had voltage present but I can't say for sure if it's the correct voltage on some boards you can actually check the MOSFETs in circuits but on this board it didn't work I just got garbage so we're gonna have to pull them out to check them but since we have voltages everywhere I checked they are probably good so it's not the most likely thing at the moment well, all the power on stuff are controlled from the south bridge here. Unfortunately, we don't have the schematics for the board. Uh, we can't access any of the pins. Uh, I checked with a multimeter and I found some voltages around the chip. So it is at least powered. Actually, we had a bad resistor pack very close to the south bridge just a couple of weeks ago in the VP6 project. Knowing this, I obviously just have to check them however unlikely it is unfortunately these are some kind of weird bus type so I'm getting really weird readings so I've got 0.1 ohm on this pin I've got 0.1 ohm between these two pins too 0.2 ohms on these two pins 0.2 and to the other side I'm getting 8k 8k to this pin too 8k and 8k they have really strange markings they have like a square and a dash on top perhaps an O or a zero I couldn't really tell and then 22 so this seems to be the common pin because I'm getting 8k to all the pins on the other side of the pack and the same thing holds true for all four resistor packs here and this guy behaves the same but it has 2.7k from a common pin here to the other side of the resistor pack so I'm gonna have to leave them just partially tested unless I can figure out what those markings mean and find a data sheet okay next I checked every single cap around this chip here but unfortunately no dead shorts on any of the surrounding caps so unfortunately it's quite possible that we have a dead south bridge here if you have any suggestions for things to try before we replace it, then please leave a comment. Otherwise, I'm going to order a new chip. I think these are reasonably easy to find. And we're going to have to go ahead and replace it. A bit of a short video this week, but I need to be elsewhere the rest of the week. So unfortunately, this is all I have time for. But I'll see you guys again next week.